Well, thank you all for coming. I know it's Friday. You've had five days of lectures, and here you are, still asking questions, crowding the speaker. I thought that's a, that's a great sign. So it seems to be going pretty well here. I wish I had a program like this when I was an undergraduate, but no, back in the back in those days, we had nothing like that at all. So this is wonderful. So in any case, I'm going to be talking about the uh, uh, political implications of immigration and demographic change. You've probably seen, just to go back to that, signs like this, voting signs all over the country. What does it mean? We're going to talk a little bit about who's voting and whether that actually matters uh, in a political kind of partisan sense. So we're going to focus on politics. We're going to focus on particularly elections and presidential elections. But of course, this is just one aspect of the whole topic of demographic change. Uh, about minority participation in the United States. For example, Kogan just told you about the tens of millions of retirees that the United States is going to have in the next uh, couple decades. So, you know, who's going to pay into the Social Security program? And when retirees sell their house, who's going to buy their house? And who's going to take their jobs when they retire? How are companies going to keep going? So these are all issues that involve demographic change in the United States, but we're going to focus on the politics today. So we have this kind of conventional wisdom out there about demography as destiny, and you've probably heard something along these lines before, which is that there is this growing demographic minority population in the United States. We have a declining white percentage of the electorate. You have demographic, uh, democratic candidates are sort of inevitably going to benefit from this. You have a GOP that maybe doubles down on a white population, which just uh, sends more minorities into the Democratic Party. And people sometimes look at California and say, as California went, so goes the nation. I mean, how did California go from being a Republican state to probably the most liberal state in the country? I mean, when I was a young person, there were Republican governors. When I was in college, when I left for graduate school, it was uh, Pete Wilson, George Duke Majin. The Republicans had very significant uh, shares in the legislature. How was it that we got from there to here in this time period? Well, one of the stories is that it was demographic change that did that. And I'm going to talk about why that might not quite be true and why it's a lot more complicated than that. And you've also got this story about how this demographic change is going to take place, that you're going to have more what we call majority minority states. We've already got almost about half a dozen of those. You're going to have what's already kind of emerging, a solid Southwest. Think about the political changes that have happened in New Mexico, which went from purple to democratic. Think about Nevada, which might be a blue state now. Arizona, which with its uh, recent victory of the Democratic Senate candidate, might be becoming a blue state. And think about Texas. Is Texas going to turn blue? This has been in the news relatively recently. And so the argument goes, when all these things happen, which they inevitably will, then that's pretty much game over for the Republican Party at the national level, that there will be a Democratic lock on the presidency, and with that, everything that goes with it, like you know the bureaucracy, uh, eventually over time, the federal courts, foreign policy, and everything else that presidents do in an age of expanded presidential power. So that's a story that you probably hear, but to what degree has that actually been happening and to what degree is it going to happen? Well, I think there are a lot of complications with that. So here's what we're going to talk about today. And I have way too many slides and we'll see if I can get through them all. But is demographic change actually happening? What kind of demographic change is going on? What are the politics of demographic change? And what are all the complexities that might get in the way of that simple story? So what are the short-term complexities and what are the long-term complexities? And also we'll consider how might the parties respond to this? So my conclusion, as you'll see, is that demographic change is happening, but that the political consequences are contingent. We don't really know what's going to happen, and the choices of today are going to shape the politics of tomorrow. No party will inevitably benefit or uh, lose out from this process. There are certainly a whole variety of scenarios out there, but I don't think that anything is inevitable in politics. I've been around just enough time to experience the future. And I can tell you that the future does not always pan out the way that the past thinks that it's going to. But we also could see a dynamic of self-fulfilling prophecies, where if people think that this is the story and they act according to this story, they might actually bring that story about in a way that is not necessary and harms their own interests. So there are a lot of complications. And we're going to talk about some of these. So for example, acculturation and assimilation. There's a lot of evidence for this. And with acculturation and assimilation, as we'll see, people's partisanship begins to switch. Geography and location also matter. Demographic change may happen, but if it's all happening in solid red or solid blue states, then does it really matter? 
demographic change also has a degree of contingency in order to really be powerful. So minorities are the most powerful when non-minorities are pretty much evenly split. The trouble is you don't find a lot of elections like that, whether we're talking about state elections or we're talking about uh, presidential elections in an electoral college system. You just don't find a lot of examples like that as we'll see. There's also naturalization. There's a lot of migration going on, but immigrants are fairly slow to naturalize, which means that over a very long period of time, so for example, the, uh, the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986 legalized 2.7 million people. 32 years later, maybe 40% of them have become citizens. That's a three decade change, 60% of them still not citizens. When you look at the percentage of people who have not only become citizens, but report that they vote in elections, and when you look at where they're actually located, you actually go from this, uh, this sort of funnel where you have a large number of potential voters to a really tiny number of voters. So even something as powerful as large numbers of migrants coming to America like we've seen since uh, 1965 doesn't necessarily have the political effects, the sort of partisan electoral effects that we think that it might have. Demographic change also depends a lot on who the candidates are. There are big differences in how candidates do in attracting minority voters. Some Republicans do well, some Republicans do less well. Some Democrats do well, some Democrats do less well. So who the candidates are can really matter. And minority voters and immigrant voters also have a lot of the fundamentals that work in their vote. So when we think about how does the American public vote when it goes into a presidential election, a lot of them are already, in a sense, kind of set because they're, they've got a party affiliation, they're part of a socioeconomic group, they're in a religious group, and these things have strong associations with the vote. That's true for minority and immigrant voters too. So if we wanna look at who are the Republicans, for example, among, let's say, Latino voters, one of the things that really strikes out, or uh, comes at you is religion. So non-Catholics, particularly Protestants, Evangelicals, Pentecostals, they're much more strongly Republican, and that's the trend in the way that the Latino population is going. The Catholic share of the Latino population has been going down. The evangelical Pentecostal share has been going up, and that's benefited Republicans. There's also been a none of the above, the so-called nuns in American politics, N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-E-S, but it's, uh, the nuns are more democratic, but they're also less institutionally affiliated because they're not part of a religion. And we know that being affiliated with institutions like religions is a really big uh, spur to voting. So there are dynamics that are going on out there that we might think of as the fundamentals that are uh, getting in the way of this kind of simple story, including, of course, the not small share of Latinos and immigrants who are at a baseline level affiliating with the Republican Party. And we've also got parallels with past immigrant groups. Sometimes people say that, oh, these immigrant groups are new and this demographic change is unprecedented. But in point of fact, we've had lots of similar kinds of dynamics in the past in American history. There have been predictions in the past that demographic change was going to benefit a particular party, namely the Democratic Party. There were immigrant groups, the Catholics of the 19th century, the Italians, the Polish, uh, uh, a whole variety of groups that came over that came to urban areas. They were politically socialized by democratic urban machines, but then you fast forward decades later and they're starting to look like the general population. They're not strongly democratic. They're becoming more Republican over time because they're, affili they're, ass they're assimilating, they're acculturating, and they're sort of moving into the political mainstream. So we've seen the predictions in the past that say these changes are going to you know, rearrange party politics, but they never really quite seem to. And so since they didn't then, why should they now? So the three articles that you read are discussing various aspects of this, the demography is destiny kind of argument. They're done in three time periods. One is in the Bush time period, one was after the Romney defeat, and the other is after the Trump victory. And you'll see in these articles in particular the argument that candidates matter, these candidates are not the same, Latino voters respond differently to them, also Asian American voters too, which is not talked about very much in political science, but probably should be, and also it shows how the fundamental political factors really do matter and shape the vote. Sometimes people talk about Latino or immigrant electorates as if they're just kind of like open to whoever makes the best argument for them, as if they're not anchored in some kind of socioeconomic, religious, political kind of fundamentals, but they really are. Uh, this whole talk about, let's say, Latinos as swing voters, as if like the population might just like suddenly move over to like one party to the next. You don't see that. And you don't also see that in the 2016 election. Despite what a lot of pundits said, 
Donald Trump did, I think, relatively well with Latinos. He probably got in the mid-high 20% range, which is about what Mitt Romney got. Now, it's not the high of Bush with 40%. It's not the high of Reagan with 35%. But lots of people were predicting that Trump would do in the teens, maybe, with uh, Latino voters, and that didn't turn out to be true. And it turned out to help him in places like Florida that it wasn't true. And this is important because uh, it tells you a little bit something about how Latino voters and immigrant voters are often anchored in particular perspectives. So this is the kind of thing that you often see in the media. This is from The Economist, The Law of Large Numbers, and you see this thing, the Hispanicization of America. So people read these kinds of articles and they think to themselves, well, you know, America must be undergoing some kind of super fundamental change, maybe a change that's different than we've seen in the past. And you've probably seen slides like this. So this is the population of the United States from 1970 to 2013, so over a 40-year time period. You do see that minority groups are growing. There's been significant immigration since the 1965 uh, Immigration Act uh, reformed how people were allowed to come into the United States, and we still basically live under that law today. Immigration really went up since it had been limited in the 1920s by those immigration laws. You can see the percentage of immigrants and the number of immigrants. You see this uh, decline in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and that was because of the immigration laws in the 1920s. But then you can see with the 60s, it starts to go back up again. We're not at the height of the, of, in American history of what is the foreign-born percentage. That was uh, earlier in the 20th century, but we're getting pretty close to that. If you look at where people are coming from in the United States, you'll see that they used to come from the, uh, the red, which is Europe, and now there's not that large a share that comes from Europe. If you look at the blue, that's from Latin America, and if you look at the green, that's from Asia. So the nature of who's coming to the United States has changed a lot over the last 50 years. If you look at the percentage Hispanic of the American population, now notice this is not the electorate. Sometimes people get confused by this. They think, oh, you know, 25% of the American population is going to be voting. Uh, that, that's Latino. It's going to be Latino in the, in by 2050 or something like that. But that's not true. We're talking about just the population itself. It's very different between the population and the electorate. But this is a kind of standard estimate that about a quarter of the population will be Latino by, by mid-century, which really isn't that far away. And uh, in terms of Hispanic numbers, too, they've been growing fairly large and fairly steadily. And most of these estimates have been underestimates. So usually the population is larger than uh, demographers think. If we sort of look at a county level map of the United States, you can go forward, do, 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 start there, 90, 2000, 2006, it's even more. You can see how the Latino population is moving out of its kind of southwest, Florida, northeast, Chicago kind of base and moving into all parts of the country, including places that we might think of as sort of battleground states like Georgia, North Carolina, uh, expanded parts of the Great Lake into Wisconsin, um, Michigan, Ohio. So does this have some kind of electoral uh, implication? If you look at the future, this is the United States. These are these really great kind of charts that tell you uh, where the population is. Well, the white population really sort of peaked in this older kind of 50s, 60s year old age group and has been declining ever since in every age category. The Latino population just gets larger with every age category. If you look at a state like Texas, you'll see it's even more dramatic. So basically, if you look at under the age of 30, the majority of the population, there are more Latinos than whites under the age of 30 for each one of these bars. So the white population, again, it sort of is large in the 50s, 60 year old, but then it starts to decline and the Latino population gets even larger. And these are just some kind of fun estimates. It's ridiculous to estimate the American population by 2100. I mean, the Martian invasion may change everything in 2088, who knows? It's really, if you tried to estimate what American populate politics would be like in, in 1919, you would have missed everything. I mean, think of all the things you would have missed in the 20th century. So you may see these kinds of estimates here, but I can tell you that they just don't mean a whole lot. We've also, people also talk about demographic changes on migration function, but there's also a lot of natural increase, births minus deaths. If you look at how the electorate, the Latino electorate changed from 2012 to 2016, you'll see that most of it was people turning 18. So of 3.2 million uh, Latinos, uh, native born citizens turned 18, 1.2 million immigrants naturalized and became uh, US citizens. This, these are eligible voters, not everyone's voting. You have a, a movement out of Puerto Rico to the United States, primarily to Florida, 
uh, to the mainland United States. And so that's uh, increased a little bit than you have a certain percentage of people, about half a million in number who have died, who were voter eligible. But you can see how the Latino population changes. It's the blue and the red numbers there, but it's mostly because of, uh, it's mostly because of natural increase, births minus deaths. Migration has been going down as a, as a f direct factor in this. And when you look at how the American population will change over time, what you'll see is that it's primarily Hispanic. So the total population that we think we're going to have uh, change in uh, 2050 is primarily uh, two-thirds uh, Hispanic. And the non-Hispanic white alone is probably only going to contribute 7.6 million people out of 156.9 million people. So we're talking about a very small percentage of future population growth that's going to be non-Hispanic white. So what are the electoral implications of all of this? Well, if you look over time from 1988, thanks to the Pew, you will see that the white share of, the, uh, of voters has been going down, but it's been going down steadily, and I think this is an important point. When we talk about minorities and immigrants, we often use these kind of scary geological metaphors like you know, waves and you know, tsunamis and things like that, which I think is exactly the wrong metaphor. It's much more like a kind of plate tectonics. You know, the continents all used to be one, and then slowly they kind of moved apart, and you know, people could kind of adjust when over a million years, you know, the continents moved an inch apart or something like that. So I think people could adjust back then, and I think that politics can adjust today. Because these, popu these changes from year to year are cumulatively large. If you say, well, how has the voting, how has the electorate changed over a 30-year period? It looks more than if you say, well, how did it change from last year? Or how did it change from the previous election? So we're seeing pretty small changes from year to year. If you look at the composition of voters, it looks more dramatic if you look at younger voters, 18 to 29, than 30 plus. But as we know in social science, who votes at high rates? 18-year-olds? No. It's this group, it's the 30 plus, they vote at high rates, the 18 to 29 population is voting at a pretty low rate. So yes, there are a lot of Latino eligible voters now in the 18 to 29 year old category. They also vote at incredibly low rates compared to the rest of the country. This is in midterm elections going all the way up to 2018. Again, we can see that in these elections which are relatively low turnout, yes, the population has been diversifying, but again, it's been slow from year to year. <clears throat> 